you are going to learn principles spiritual principles patterns and dimensions of intelligence that you have never heard of I can assure you of that I know of the pedigree of Bishop Tudor Bismarck I know of the pedigree of some of the ministers coming and I've met Pastor PK who has blown me away my job is to show you how to ascend I will leave addressing territories to those who are generous in the field because they have records they have antecedents so when they speak they will speak from the place of authority but me I know how to ascend <laughs> so I will talk to you about ascensions because when you study the life of Abraham one of the things he learned in his encounter with God is the way of ascension through altars and so Abraham literally lived on altars if you notice, most of the things Abraham did were a product of direct instructions given to him from the places of encounters. He didn't initiate his first encounter with God, but he knew what to do to keep the presence of God. So after the first encounter, he created an altar, and that altar became a vent, a gangway from heaven to earth. So he knew how to access the realm of God. And so for Abraham, his relationship with God became a progressive journey. It was no longer something that happened once in a while because God chose to visit him. It became something that he could transact through a deliberate spiritual process and a protocol initiated by the intelligence he had on account of his encounters. Now, after he encountered Melchizedek, you saw that Melchizedek validated that thing that he gleaned when he encountered God. And so Melchizedek showed him that for you to dominate in the marketplace of nations, you must always have encounters with the spirit of Elohim. And so he had to meet Melchizedek before meeting the king of Sodom. And when Abraham left Melchizedek, that became his way of life. Now, in Genesis chapter 18, you now notice that when God was passing, God didn't need to visit. Abraham recognized him. The Bible said three men were passing. But when Abraham saw them, he said, these are not men. Although they carry the similitude of men, he said, this one looked like Elohim. And Abraham said, please drop back. Come into the house and let me wet you. Because you must have been, you are stressed by the, the hunger, the drought of the field. The people said, no, we will not. He insisted. And he dragged them into the house. And he fed them, he washed them. And when they were going, God now revealed himself. And began to talk to him about what looked like a challenge. He said, in the next time of life, when I visit again, your wife Sarah will bear a child. Abraham began to address him as Lord. Even though Sarah laughed, God said, why did she laugh? She said, no, I didn't laugh. No, he said, but you laughed. But don't worry. That laugh that you laugh will become the name of the child you will bear. Because now, <laughs> you think you are laughing because you are doubting me. But I'm bringing laughter into your life. <laughs> and when he was going, Abraham now followed. And he began to tell Abraham, Issues that border on kings and nations again. I'm going to Sodom. The Sodom that you delivered, now I'm going to destroy it. Because like you said, when the king of Sodom came, he came with a dimension, a demonic order. And that order had affected the culture of the people. You see that Sodom was the headquarter of perversion. What you call LGBTQ today had its root in Sodom. And because the king of Sodom received his authority from his demonic priesthood, the impact of his priesthood will have to shape the culture of the territory. And so when they engaged in perversion, it was an act of worship to the spirit that powered the king of Sodom. Because worship is not a song. Worship is actually a declaration of allegiance to a spirit. You can do it through a song, you can do it through a lifestyle. But in the nation of Sodom, perversion 
was the dimension of worship that ascended. And this time, the iniquity of Sodom had ascended to heaven and God was going to destroy it. And he had to tell Abraham, although once upon a time you had to save them because of Lot, now I'm going to destroy it. And Abraham knew that if he didn't do anything about it, the nation will be destroyed. Now, if kings of the earth are coming against Sodom, you can raise an army. But when the king of heaven is coming, you need intercession. <laughs> Imagine if all Abraham knew was to train soldiers, he would have been handicapped. But this time around, he has understood how to negotiate, not only in the table of nations, but in the tables of Zion. And they say, far be it from you, God of heaven, that the righteous judge will destroy both the righteous and the iniquity and the evil. What if you find 50 righteous men? And God told him, if I find 50 righteous men, I will spare the land. Abraham negotiated until he reached 10. He assumed that Lot learned something. But unfortunately, Lot only learned principles and strategies. He didn't know the way of ascension. That's why in this conference, in addition to the principles and the strategies you will learn, you must learn the way of ascension. Because Abraham could fight on the right and on the left. On the right was his ascension to heaven. On the left was his negotiation power in the table of nations. And so if we don't bring the two together, we will not be relevant. That's why Lot was always a victim. You ask yourself, why is this guy always the victim? Because he didn't have ascensions. He didn't know how to travel to navigate Zion. But Abraham knew that gateway. So when he had to do with the nations of the world, he had an army that he trained. When he has to do with heaven, he had technologies of priesthood where he could go to the heights of the heaven. Tonight, I want to show you some of the protocols that makes for navigation to the heavenly realms as far as priesthood is concerned it will help you to understand priesthood in its most organic sense because there is the organic dimension of priesthood and there's also the application of priesthood the application of priesthood is what you do when you contend with nations but the organic dimension of priesthood is what you do for you to come to zion because if you don't come to zion you have nothing to apply and so tonight i want to show you five realms of migrations as we begin to do the business of priesthood and it will help me define what priesthood really is in its organic sense you know when god created man and created his kingdom the kingdom of god is not for christians <laughs> you know they were called christians in antioch because they saw they looked like christ but the kingdom of God is for priests. That means if you are not a priest, although you have all the blessings of God, you cannot enjoy it. Because on one side is what God has done for you. But over and above what God has done for you, there is what God is doing in you and there is what God will do through you. It is in priesthood that you will receive what God is doing in you and through you. The finished works of Christ is what God has done for you. But when you come to priesthood through your interaction with the Holy Ghost, God will begin to walk in you so that God can walk with you. And many don't know this. And so when we operate as Christians and not priests, we will keep singing what Jesus has done, but we will not have what it takes to manifest it. Meanwhile, the battle of existence is a battle of evidence. The things you talk about, can you demonstrate it? So priesthood comes to help us demonstrate what Jesus has made available to us. And that is why from the beginning, the plan of God was priesthood. In Genesis chapter 2 from verse 15, after God created the man, Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 2, 7, put him in the garden of Eden. In Genesis 2, 15, God told him, dress the garden and keep it. Those are two vital words. The word dress is the word yada. And that word means cultivate the garden. And the word keep is the word shama. That word means to defend it. So these two words in the original sense is priesthood and guardianship. So on one side, you need to have what it takes to be relevant in the territory. On another side, you need to have what it takes to keep the territory connected to heaven so that it doesn't lose its relevance. So when he created Adam, he had priesthood in mind. After man fell, God came, introduced priesthood to Abraham. After man was taken in slavery, when God encountered Moses again, in Genesis 19 from verse 4 to verse 6, he introduced priesthood again. 
He said, see how I've delivered you by my mighty hand. I took you on eagle's wings so that I will make you a kingdom of priests. I came to make priests because only by priesthood can there be connection to heaven and there will be dominion on the face of the earth. And that pattern never changed. Even after Jesus came and resurrected, Peter came and reiterated the same emphasis. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he said, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. God's own special people called forth to showcase his excellency. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, John reiterated it. He said, unto him that washed us and made us kings and priests unto God. So we were designed to function in the kingdom of God as priests. And as priests, we must first of all know how to keep interaction with the heavens and then by extension, know how to apply that interaction to dominate the earth realm. Because if we don't, those who have demonic priesthood will dominate this realm. And when you start studying how civilizations are formed, you will discover that it is this same program that devils use to establish civilizations. This same program. You know, when Cain departed from the presence of God, the Bible says Cain began to pioneer a new civilization. We didn't know what happened. We didn't know how Cain came about that civilization, but when we saw the DNA of that civilization, we knew it was not consistent with God. Because territories reveal the essence of the spirits that inspired their creation. And so when we saw the texture of that civilization, we knew God was apart from it. We knew God was not involved in that civilization. It was later Paul began to teach us how spirits establish civilizations. And he began to tell us how principalities come first. Then powers come. Then rulers of the darkness of this world come. And then spiritual wickedness come. Because that is the ecclesia of the demonic realm. Like you said, the pattern of the Roman government. When they want to dominate a city, they send their agents there to colonize you. So that they rule you in your own land. And so when you study this progression, you will see that principality, the word principality means first in rank. And what it means is that they enter a territory first. They are the ones who come to establish governance. Because that word is also the word al -K. It's a word for authority. So principalities are princes, beings of authority that have the capacity to colonize territories. You would think it's just about first. It's not first in, in, in terms of numerical value. It's actually first in terms of governance. They are the ones who bring governance. If you study Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, when Paul was given the hierarchy of creation, he said Jesus is first. He created all things. All things were created for him, both visible and invincible. He now went further to say, then you have thrones. That's when you will now know that thrones are not seats. They are creatures. And so the 24 elders are thrones. And so when you study the nature of thrones, thrones are princes that are invited to co-rule with God. Jesus was speaking to the 12 disciples. He said, at the end of time, he said, you will sit with me on 12 thrones to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So there are people who have passed their ordination. And because of the extent to which they fulfill their ordination, God will invite them to exercise dominion. And authority with him. So when you find creatures who graduate as overcomers to coru with God, they are called thrones. Now, after thrones, you have dominions. A dominion is a prince that is given legal authority over a territory. So a dominion is like a governor in the spirit realm. That's why when man was created and earth was given to him, man was called a dominion. He said, let them have dominion. And he went further to say, the heavens belong to God. He said, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So you cannot possess a territory until you are a dominion. And so a dominion is a prince that has authority over a territory. That's the realm we were created to function from. When we finish from earth and we pass the test of dominion, we will graduate to become thrones. Not every man will be a throne. But every man is supposed to be a dominion. Because God allocated the earth to us as our territory of rulership. That's how Paul rated the Kedah. It was after throne in Colossians 15 and 16 that Paul spoke about principalities. That means principalities are also princes 
but they don't have territory to superintend over. But the job of principalities is that they take a territory. When they have secured the territory and colonized it, dominions come to take over. Wow. And when they take over, then establishment of new laws are created that become the culture of the people. Our forefathers didn't know that they were encountering spirits. And so when those spirits encountered them, what the spirits did was to write laws for them. Those laws are our culture now. And because we have those cultures, we are bound to worship them forever and ever until a superior priesthood comes. Every time you say thy kingdom come is a declaration of war. Because what you are trying to do is to uproot the kingdom that was to establish a new kingdom. So the point I'm making is that if we don't encounter God in light, we will encounter demons in darkness. And you know the way principalities work? When they show up, what they do is that they look, you know, the devil can't give any gift. He's primarily a being of destruction. They are finding out what their weaknesses are. And so some of them love money. Some of them love flamboyance. Some of them love women. The job of the principality is to create a system where all of these things are available. And as they give those things to them, they draw their attention from God. And they begin to pursue those things. Now, when they pursue those things to a level, their appetites become bigger. And the more the appetites become big, the more of it they want. So, the principality will now come for a deeper negotiation. If you want more, then you have to enter a covenant. But he started by checking their abilities. Now, those abilities are supposed to be the abilities harnessed on the altar of priesthood. But because they didn't have priesthood in light, the devil initiated priesthood in darkness. Those of us who are apostolic in nature, we are creatures of authority. One of our predominant abilities is faith. We can make declarations and break territories open. When the principalities come, they will know that your weakness will be pride. So they will create a system that anchor on your pride. And you will be driven away from God because of your pride. The job of the principality is to make sure he established quadrants of such people. And when he has established them, these people will now give them legality to establish their dominion in the territory. Because they didn't have the original dominion. The dominion belonged to the men. But the men has to have to give clearance. But they need to find out where they can negotiate with the men. And when they have negotiated and the clearance is given, then they begin to establish their dominion. So what happens is that when a principality finishes its job, a power now comes. What you call an addiction is not an addiction. It's the operation of a power. It binds you to that thing that has drawn you away from God. And so when a power binds you, then a ruler of darkness comes. The word ruler of darkness is cosmos kratos. They are magistrates that create laws in the cosmos. So what they do is that that thing that is an addiction becomes a law. That's when even if you want to break out, you can't anymore. You will need deliverances for it to happen. But even at that time, it has become a principle that runs your life. Because a ruler of darkness has come. And when they see that your job with them is over, then spiritual wickedness comes. Those are called ponerias. Their job is to afflict. So the lady began, first of all, pursuing money and going to her lottery and thinks she's doing well. After a while, she has HIV. The guy who was supposed to be a prophet thought he was making money and enjoying women. After a while, he is publicly disgraced and he dies of depression. So he can never fulfill his ordination anymore. Because if you fail, you will enter the ordinations of darkness. Meanwhile, these beings don't stop there. All of the things I've explained here is where they make agents from. Agents are the puppets of demonic spirits. They use them to fulfill their agenda. They send them all over. But amongst agents, they select a few who are specially gifted and empower them and they are called witches and wizards. A witch is a being that has a man or a woman a, that has the power to cast spells. So when a principality comes to Zambia, for example, and discovers their prophets here, he will have many agents here that pursue immorality, pursue flamboyant things. When he's using them, he will now raise some of them to become witches. Those witches will cast spells into the atmosphere so that those things will thrive. So you will not know why a move of faith, false prophets will begin. You will not know why a move of seduction begin. Some have become casters of spells. And he won't stop there. He will raise some to become warlocks. You know, those of you who watch medieval movies, you will see how kingdoms are made, are formed. They are formed through sorcery. Most nations. 
including some of the leading nations of the world. How many of you have watched Merlin? How many of you have watched Merlin? You see that the, the prince thinks it's his bow and arrow that is winning battle. He didn't know that the young man who was following him was the warlock. When he meets the dragon, he addresses him as young warlock. The guy has the power to cast spare. He has the power to create victory, even where there's no victory. So that at the end of the day, they will achieve Albion, a territory where sorcery and witchcraft will be allowed to be practiced free of charge. That's their goal. So the reason they are preserving the life of the prince is to achieve Albion. That's how territories are formed in darkness if the priesthood of light is not established. And some will grow from warlocks to become sages. A sage is a teacher in darkness. Those ones have the power to impart those abilities. So our fathers here will tell you that those days, somebody can come to you and say, cut the grass and give me. If you give him, he will say some things, rub his hand on you, and scorpion will never sting you again. He has the power to transfer demonic powers. So he has now been trained in darkness. That's how these people influence what you call the marketplace. That's how they influence what you call government. So the reason most you go to certain nations, the foundation of governance is corruption. Is because some sages and warlocks spoke it into the foundation. So even if a good man comes to leadership, that power will bend his will because it was rooted as a heritage of that territory. You now go to another territory, they are very innovative, like where we came from in the Middle East. You see wisdom, you see excellence, and you say, how come these people are like this? You think this is the best. You now go under, you see oppression and violence. What gives them joy is to spill blood. And so anywhere they go to, blood is spilled like water. You go to another territory, you say these are scientifically inclined. They are learned people. Why is Africa not like this? You now discover that there is perversion and immorality. So the, what they teach them is that sex is exercise. And it ruins the souls of people. So on one side, you see poverty and backwardness. On another side, although there is excellence, but you see violence. On another side, although there is a, a scientific inclinations, intelligence, but you see corruption, you see lawlessness, you see immorality. The signatures are different depending on the laws that are written. So before you go to those territories, you must have a priesthood in light that can uproot those foundations. Otherwise, you can go to America and be a successful businessman, but you'll be an immoral person. Because the priesthood does not negate financial prosperity, but it negates purity of the soul. And so you are excelling, but a point comes, you become godless. And if you are there for five years, you will start wondering, what do I need God for? Because the system, the law that is written in that atmosphere is that the higher you go, the more irrelevant God is to you. And you will not know what is happening. And then you are insulting those in Africa. You say they are backward. See how poor they are. You don't know what is going on. A point will come when, if you are there for 15 years, you will not even know how to say Jesus is loved. Because something has gone wrong with your soul. In fact, a point will come, you start feeling, you say, I love a man. And they say, what do you mean? Say, that's how I feel. I live by how I feel. And you see a man, say he loves a man. He didn't know that he's a victim of the demonic priesthood. Meanwhile, there's a lot of advancement in civilization, but the heart is dark. And then you come to this side of Africa. You are highly religious. You are praying. You are fasting. But you are irrelevant in the marketplace. Because you don't have the intelligence to contend there. And even those who are in your government, corruption eats their soul up. The money that belongs to the nation, five people share it. And they think wisdom is to go to Dubai and sleep in five-star hotel. So they are backward mentally because of demonic intelligence. You go to the Middle East, you say, ah, this excellence is out of this world. But you see the sword everywhere. Cutting people's head is wisdom. And they think that is, that is how to live your life if you are, if you are relevant, if you are wise. All of those things are codes written into different territories because civilizations are formed from the roots of darkness. And so when God is calling us into priesthood, he is to revamp the foundation of civilization. It's not just to succeed in business. It's to change the laws in the marketplace. It's not just to succeed in government. It's to change the laws in the government. So when a man who carries a priesthood enters the government, he will not just rule well and bring advancement in civilization. He will change the laws. And a day will come when this same government that if you don't involve in corruption, you will not win, will change.
the order will change because a new priesthood has been established so beyond having a president that is interested in education and interested in in, in developing the people you need a president that have the power to change the code so that when another political dispensation comes what it takes to go into that office would have changed the people who have money to bribe they will say keep your money we don't need it we need a righteous man when you see tough things happening know that a new priesthood has come because it's no longer about money during election anymore what is your manifesto what is your plan for the people people start thinking differently because the atmosphere has changed but you see for us to ascend to that height there's a protocol and so tonight i want to show you five levels of ascension in the priesthood of light you know most of us don't know what we are contending with sir what we are fighting is an age-long darkness the foundation is deep this is why sunday morning christianity can't help it we are interested in a large auditorium so people gather we are running five services and we teach for 30 minutes is it a teaching of 30 minutes that will raise men who can change the corruption in the market is this a teaching of 30 minutes that will raise men who can change the foundation of government no that's not the pattern the apostles brought they knew how deep darkness was so they needed to sit with them to cook them before they ascend. Before you go to... See, there are certain men in government that if they tell you to do corruption, you will not have the guts to say no. Because of the weight of darkness they bring to you. You know if you say no, you are doomed. Unless you have something superior to what they carry. For you to look at them in the eye. Do you think it was a joke when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said, we will not bow. If you collide with a king of Babylon, you have no, you dare not say no. Before you can look at that king to in the face and say, I will not, you must have something that is more ranking than his priesthood. And the problem we have is that we have not raised men who have priesthood in light. We bring them to church from January to December and we are prophesying breakthrough. This week is your week. Next week you will prosper. It's a joke. The moment they enter the marketplace, they are swept off. Even most of us who are succeeding, we are succeeding on the plane of compromise. When you check, somebody testifies, I just bought a new land. I started a new oil business. Go and check. Most of the transactions are full of compromise. You have few men who are wielding the scepter of righteousness. Because we don't know that our kingship functions to the degree of the efficacy of our priesthood. This is a journey of the spirit. And it's one that will take all of you. When Abraham sat at the gate of Mamre, the transactions he was carrying out were deep transactions. And I want to show you a few things that will cause you to ascend. And when you ascend, I will show you some of the ranks that you will begin to possess in the realm of God. Some ranks. Because we are, we are different ranking. Pastor P.K. was sharing with me how he called for a business meeting. And people came with hijab. There was no, is he a pastor or not? That doesn't matter. And when he's doing that meeting, he preaches to them. He prays for them. He prophesies to them. Even if they don't like it, the weight of glory he brings into the meeting, they can't say no. You may think his strategy, design a good card, invite them, they won't come. Because there is a rank, there is a height a man speaks from. And every one of us who is a Christian, we must not travel only horizontally. We must also learn to start traveling vertically. The vertical journeys of the spirit. That's where priesthood comes into the equation. Vertical travels. And so if you want to engage priesthood in order to ascend, let me show you five molecules of priesthood that provokes transitions and ascensions in the spirit. I'm preparing you from height so that you can go horizontally. Because some of, some of you, the reason God has hidden you from certain levels of finances is to help your soul. Because the day you touch one million dollars, your whole convictions will break. If you see it in the, you see it in the, the letter, you see wraps of dollars, they will say, will you key? You say, uh, is, is it how many people? If it's not many, I can try. You, something will hit you that your priesthood can't contain. So even though you know the principle, God is hiding you. If you go now, you will compromise. And I'm more interested in your soul than in your money. 
So let me preserve your soul first. But you see, when you know these things and you are built up, God can send you to the throne. God can send you to the market. Because now he knows that you are secured. And he knows that when you go there, it's his kingdom that you will advance. This is what priesthood comes to do for you. Taking the market is where royalty comes in. But ascending to heaven is where the office of the priest becomes very vital. And there are a few molecules that support ascension. Number one, it is what we call ministering to the Lord. Exodus 28 from verse 1. I want to show you, see, learn these things, master them. There are certain business meetings before you go to. Ask those who are in the market, they will tell you. They will ascend before they go out. Because if you don't go to certain heights, you won't even have the wisdom to transact. And for you to ascend, there are ladders. And the first is to minister to the Lord. He said, now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister to me as priest. So the job of priesthood and the key for ascension in priesthood is the ability to minister to the Lord. When a priest wants to interact with Elohim, when a, prince, a priest wants to ascend in the realm of God, the first ladder he will ascend is the ladder of ministering to the Lord. And ministering to the Lord is a statement in the spirit. It means you have come to a point where you see God beyond your circumstance. Because your circumstance will clog your soul and pull you down. Every time you want to ascend, you will discover that the things of life will weigh on your soul. And so a man who knows the pathway to the heights of heaven is a man that knows how to let go of his experiences and his circumstances and minister to the Lord. Ministering to the Lord is simply an act of praising and exhorting him for who he is, not for what he has done. You must come to that point where for you, God becomes your unique goal. You see, even the doctrine we teach in church today trains people to be carnal. Yes. Because we make them feel that all they come to God for are material blessings. Yeah. But the order of the kingdom is that material blessings are supposed to be an addition. Yeah. The higher you go, the more you possess. And you possess it not by hustling, sometimes by wisdom, sometimes by favor, sometimes by discernment. You enter into strategies superior to what is studied in the university. And so you know what to do part-time. You can sit down in January 2023 and invest in something that will begin to blossom in March 2024. And nobody saw it, but you bought it at a share rate that when you make even one dollar on all the shares you bought, you'll become a billionaire. But it will take priesthood for you to see. That's the ego eye. You see thought from a height. And when God wants to improve us and increase us, one thing he teaches us is how to journey up. You journey up so that you can possess things in the natural. Ask the people making impact. They make impact through the advantages they have by reason of height. And so they take steps that nobody takes. They see things that nobody sees. And so it gives them an edge. But for you to journey, you must let go of the things that weigh on your soul and minister to the Lord. In Acts chapter 13 from verse 1, the Bible said, some of the prophets and teachers in Antioch, and he listed five of them. The Bible said they gathered together and they ministered to the Lord in prayer and fasting. The moment they began, the heavens opened, the Holy Ghost said. So things will not download from heaven except as men begin to send incense to Zion. And if you study your Bible in Revelation chapter 4, the only thing those who sit in close proximity to God do is to minister to the Lord. He said the 20 and 4 elders, day and night, from Revelation 4, 11, all they were doing, worthy is he that sits on the throne. All things were created for thy pleasure. To him belong glory, honor, power, majesty. That's all they were doing. And as you begin to do that, you discover that you become light. Because the things that weigh on your soul will give way. I know there's a house rent to pay. I know there are interviews to attend. I know there are businesses that are failing. But if you don't ascend, you can't address them. 
And so the way to address, to ascend, is to detach yourself from those things and begin to exalt his name. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him adoration. Give him majesty. As you are doing it, after a while, you will discover that your wings will begin to appear. That's when you will know that what the mirror told you about yourself is not complete. Because we have many dimensions that are hidden. If God reveals them, the world will run from us. Some of you have horns. Some of you have wings in the spirit. It's a day that wait upon the Lord. Something happens to them. Your wings come out. But for you to go that far, you begin by ministering to the Lord. What do you know about God? I know you want to go and dominate the marketplace. I know you want to go and take over government. When a man begins to join the medical arts and starts to the Lord and the rest of the And that plan is not that I'm there for 10 hours, is that I will focus on the program for a period of time so that every sister can come back to it. And for those who understand how this is work, they know things that help their focus. And so you find some people, they are there reciting scriptures, meditating on scriptures. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What they are doing is to condition the mind to focus on the heavens. You find some, they are playing only hymns. And as the hymns are playing, they are just talking in their spirit. And after a while, they come out of the limitations of the flesh. And they come to a height where spiritual propensities are activated. And you can be on the earth and become a bishop. You can be on the earth and become an apostle. You can be on the earth and become a deacon. You can be on the earth and become a governor. It's when you go out there, you will not have the dimensions of God to show because you have not gone there. Anybody who has gone there, we have evidences that he entered Zion. If you go, it must rub off on you. And so when you want and know that this thing is what empowers you, you will pay the price. And so when you start doing priesthood, one of the things you will preserve is your hunger. Because when you are not hungry and you are using your willpower, your willpower itself will become a distraction. But when there is hunger, that hunger pulls you upward. And I can tell you, one of the things the devil attacks in your life the most is your hunger. That's why when something awakens on your inside, suddenly the devil brings distraction. Seasonal movies. Tarring on Instagram, watching pictures. Friends that you have not met for 10 years suddenly come and they want you to do everything in the season of revival. But when a man is a priest, he knows how to guard it. In Leviticus 6 12, he said, The fire on the altar must not be put out. He said, The priest must put wood on it every morning. So, the job of priesthood as touching waiting is to keep that fire burning so that you are drawn perpetually to the realm of God and your focus remains only on God. If you are able to hit that crescendo in the spirit, then you proceed to the third level. God begins to reveal himself to you. That's the realm of beholding. It is from the realm of beholding that transformation and transfiguration begins. But you see, you have to climb two ladders to reach that realm. The Bible says we are with open faces. It says beholding us in the glass, the glory of God, we are changed. If you, if, you, if you tarry and wait and you are caught up, you will see that the first thing you will encounter are the dimensions of God. For some of us, we will encounter his fire. For some of us, we will encounter his wisdom. For some of us, we will encounter his power. So you will notice that the way God equips you is not necessarily to give you things, it's to make you. And so you will discover that you become an embodiment of the wisdom of God because you have beheld wisdom. If you behold wisdom, you now go to the market. Even if it's broom they are selling, when you carry broom, what you will make out of broom will be a wonder to your generation. If you enter the market, even if it's water they are discussing, you will say something about water. And even the best minds there will marvel how they've not discovered it, even though they have studied water to PhD level. Now you are an embodiment of wisdom. Because when you see him, you become like him. And so the journey of priesthood is to take you to heights where the dimensions of God becomes real to you. You begin to see them and you begin to touch them. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Ask of me, I will answer. But what I do is beyond answering. The goal of prayer is interaction. Not just for me to meet your prayer points. 
He said, when I'm done answering your prayer points, then I suck you to realms where I show you great and mighty things that you know not of. And so when a man journeys from waiting, he comes to the realm of beholding. Do you know how Moses became mighty? Because he saw him that was invincible. And so no circumstance could swallow him up. Do you think Abraham just carried trained men to the battlefield? Go and read that scripture again. You will see what you didn't see. The Bible said Abraham took 318 trained servants from his house. And he said Abraham divided himself among them. You know what that means? It's not that he shared them into ranks. There's something Abraham carried from the realm of God. So he knew the act of translocation and bilocation. So what Abraham did was that he made himself to become part of the army. So when 318 men were marching, they were actually 319 Abrahams. And one Abraham is a nation. You think, do you think, you think 318 soldiers destroyed five kings? What training is that? Abraham divided himself amongst them. So every one of them become, became like an Abraham. And so Abraham is the father of many nations. And so one of them is bigger than the five kings. That's why that battle had no casualty. There was no record that one died. All of them came back. The only record we heard was that they returned with the spoils of war. Because you can't kill an Abraham. And so in addition to training, there was something he found in the heavens. It is the reason why from the time of Abraham, a patriarch can call you and bless you because now they know how to impart God now they know how to impart dimensions of God to people it was from the time of Abraham that that technology began because now I don't need to really be with you physically but I can divide myself into you so such as I carry I can put upon you and when you leave me the same things I experience you too can experience it the same God that intervenes for me can intervene for you it was in peace too that he learned it because when you start beholding you start becoming that's when your propensities in God are activated your journey from ministering to the Lord, to waiting upon the Lord, to beholding him, and then you come into the fourth realm, which is participation in the beloved. A point now comes where they give you a place in the realm of God. You have a place. You know, Elijah was speaking in 1 Kings 17 verse 1. He said, before God whom I stand, there shall be no rain or dew. He was speaking from a place. When you go there, and you arrive there, there is a place that is allocated to you. So you talk from your own place in God. Many have not ascended to that level. See, Paul was speaking. He said, I magnify my office. I know all of us are born again, but I have something with God. And that thing I have with God is my place in God. Peter was coming to the beautiful gate with John in Acts chapter 3. And he says, silver and gold have I known. He didn't say such as we have. All of us are born again. All of us are apostles. But there is something I have with God. There is a place I stand with God. He says such as I have. Remember, he said, look, some people can be in the healing ministry, but you are different. Ten million people can be making hair, but you are different. In fact, two of you can be on the same street. There will be no competition. Because what you carry cannot be copied. It was downloaded from Zion. And when you talk, you are talking from a throne. You are talking from a throne. That's what will bring your unique difference to you. And that difference is what will make you relevant in your generation. Everybody has a place. In the ecclesia, people are not distorted. We all have where we stand. And everyone must be there. He said the sons of God came to show themselves to God. And he said Satan also came. Why did he come? Because Job lost his place. Because this thing is about positioning. When the devil met Jesus, he said, bow to me, I'll give you all the riches of the earth. Why? Because it has been delivered to me. It belonged to Adam, but now he has lost his throne. I'm the one sitting there. And so when the devil appears, when the sons of God gather, they can't expel him because he's coming in the name of Adam. Yes. And if he's coming in the name of Adam, it's a legitimate seat. Yes. 
If I walk out of this place, assuming this is a football match, and all these seats are ticketed, if I give you my ticket, they don't care about your face. It's the ticket they scan. And so the reason the devil can also come is because Adam lost his place. And this being was talking to Jesus. Bow to me and we give these riches to you. For it has been delivered to me. Jesus didn't argue. Because it was a legitimate claim. Adam had a place that he lost. In Christ Jesus, all of us have our place. But we must stand there in priesthood. We must stand there. And as you begin to do priesthood, a point will come, you will start noticing those summons. Sometimes people go to sleep at 1 a.m. They tap you. It is your department that is praying. This is not about church. You will discover that sleep will leave your eyes. If you don't know that you are part of a quorum and it is your office that is calling you and sleep, after a while you will lose your scepter. Wow. You will now discover that that business that you were working that was doing well will suddenly start crumbling because you have lost your place. And princes are legalistic beings. Wow. And so when Christians don't know this, they violate their places in the spirit and so they decline to mental realm. And if you are operating in the mental frequency only, demons are smarter than you. Because they have lived longer than you. The diary, the document, the information they have is what all men have lived. They have it chronicled. They know your great-grandfather. You can't afford to decline to the mental frequency. You must operate at your spirit frequency. It is the spirit that will energize your mind. But if the spirit place is taken and you are only mental, you are in trouble. This is why every Christian must stand in their place. I stood in my place before I came here this evening. And because I stand in my place, if I want to change this meeting to a revival service, it won't take me five minutes. If I want to operate in the healing anointing, it won't take me five minutes because I've not lost my place. But the day you lost your place, you will discover, like Samson, you will shake yourself as at other times. You will discover that it's not about shaking. It's about where you are standing. And I can tell you, there are many Christians who are not standing. There are realms of ascension. From ministering to the Lord, you migrate to waiting upon the Lord, you migrate to beholding him so that you are changed, and then you migrate to taking your place in your generation and in the courts of God. Every one of us have a place. In Mount Zion, we all have a place, and you must answer your name. And then when you get to that level, then you hit the last and final frequency of priesthood, which is the realm of legislation and litigation. The realm of legislation and litigation is where we write laws and we enforce laws. That's where your royalty begins to speak. And that's why I told you, if there is no priesthood, there will be no kingship. Many people want to exact kingship without priesthood. And so when you look at the experiences of Christians, you will laugh. They have the scriptures, they are quoting them, but they are not leaving them. That's why Doc said that after he wrote the book, the Holy Ghost now told him, now let me give you the life. Because the Logos and the Rema are two different things. The guy is quoting accurate doctrine, but there's no proof. He is experiencing what the ordinary person who doesn't know Jesus is experiencing. The reason is because he wants to enforce laws and is not standing in the right place to enforce them. He doesn't know what it takes to operate them by experience. And so you find many Christians... They can't cast out demons. They can't excel in life. They can't live above sins. And you are wondering what is happening. They don't know priesthood. They want to begin with legislation and litigation. What is legislation? It's the act of writing and interpreting laws. That is when the scripture will become a weapon in your mouth. And so when you declare the scripture, you are not quoting Bible as a theologian. If you declare the scripture, you are writing the law over a system. You are writing the law over a territory. You are writing the law over a people. So two people can stand here and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. One, we speak, nothing happens. Another speaks, every sickness goes. Because one of them is a legislator. Now the scripture are a weapon in his mouth because of where he's talking from. He's talking from revelation. He's talking from intimacy. He's talking from the realm of God. Peter said, holy men of God speak. 
as they were carried by the Spirit of God. Too many Christians are on earth talking and the princes are looking at them from the Spirit and say, who are you? When it has to do with the, the future and the verdicts over nation, it's not intellectual, it is spiritual. It only passes through the gate of the intellectual, but it has its root in the spiritual. And so many are not legislators. And then when you legislate, you also litigate. Litigation is the ability or the authority to enforce a law. And so when laws are violated, you can come and say, no, it must be this way. It must be the way God has said it. That's when you become God's agency. Now, when your spirit get, your priesthood get to this level where you become a legislator and a litigator, God now begins to define your ranks. This is the ranking of priesthood. And this is where men are different. And what I'm telling you here, please don't make the mistake of thinking I'm talking about apostles and prophets. I'm talking about believers who have a walk with God. See, there are three offices that is for every Christian. Number one is the office of a son. Number two is the office of a priest. And number three is the office of a king. Every believer is expected to grow into these three offices. But you see, you can be an apostle and be a child. You can be a prophet and be a child. And you can be an ordinary believer, yet you are a priest and a king. Because you know how to walk with God. And you know how to operate under his government. And I can tell you, many Christians are not there. That's why a point comes, they become frustrated and they say, these things they are saying in church, is it true? Every day we come to church, they say we will take over. And we have been here for 10 years, we have not taken over. And you see many people become angry at church. You told me, I will take over my job, I've just been sacked. You are sacked because you don't go to where decisions are made. You told me, anything I lay my hands to do will prosper. I tried five businesses, it's not working. Forget all these pastors, now scam them be. They are not scammers. You don't know the protocol. This is the protocol I'm teaching you. See, in addition to Sunday morning service, you have a journey in the spirit. And if you don't journey, you will not exercise authority. If you journey to the point of a legislator and a litigator, God begins to give you ranks. And if it is the part of priesthood, the first rank you will attain is the rank of an intercessor. An intercessor is not a prayer warrior. <laughs> Make no mistakes about it. An intercessor is one who has been vetted by God to be able to stand in the gap for others. A prayer, a prayer warrior can pray prayer points. He can pray with prayer power. But God has not vetted him to stand in the gap. An intercessor is one that God has vetted to stand in the gap for others. This is why I told you, when priesthood begins to play its maximum purpose, the goal will not just be, I'm succeeding in the market. The goal will be that I'm changing the laws in the market. When priesthood enters its reality, the goal will not just be that I won an election. I'm now governor, I'm now president. No, the goal is that you are changing the laws that makes for the workings of that institution. Because everything that governs how that institution runs before you is a priesthood. So when you come with a new priesthood, you must change the modernity. And so if people are winning elections through corruption in Zambia, if you come in by the priesthood of Melchizedek, you will not just win an election, you will change the order. And so after you, anybody who comes through corruption will lose. That's what priesthood does. If people are succeeding in business through compromise and a new priesthood is erected, business will now become something you succeed in through integrity and transparency. That's how priesthood works. And these are some of the things that shape nations. So when we are talking about marketplace priesthood, we are talking about men that have rank to bring legislation and litigation so that they can change systems, alter paradigms, and establish new ideologies that will now govern how operations are carried out within the context of the territory where they find themselves. And you must journey to become a legislator and a litigator. When you get there, you now start receiving ranks. You know, when you become a general, you can be a one-star general. 
You can be a two-star general. You can be a three-star general. You can be a four-star general. And then you can be a five-star general. There are some things you can do as a one-star general. A one-star general is a brigadier general. They can keep him in charge of a, bat of a battalion or a brigade. But when you become a two-star general, they can make you director of operations. Because at that level, you are now a major general. So beyond the battalion, you can hold a position in the armed forces of the nation. So you can head operations, you can head intelligence, you can head, then you become a three-star general. In certain nations, the chief of defense staff is a lieutenant general, a three-star general. Because most nations don't even have four-star generals. To show you how these things work. So the whole armed forces may have a gap of four-star generals. Because you don't just give people rank to fill up. <laughs> no, the rank is not a buffet where you pick what you want. People don't fill up. They grow. It is entrustments. They are end. They are badges that are end. And so the same thing happens in priesthood. As all of us begin to minister to the Lord until we are sent and we all become legislators and litigators, you will see that our authorities will be different. Why do many people fail? They want to operate authority levels that they are not qualified for. And they think because we are all e Christians, we are all equal. It's a joke. In salvation, we are equal because God paid the same price for all of us. But in kingdom, we are different. Because the assignment God can entrust us with are different. We are not the same. I'm telling you, we are not the same. And so as you become a legislator and a litigator, you begin to press. That's why two people can be marketplace apostles. One is doing business with ambassadors and kings. Another one will do business with local government chairmen. That's his level of clearance. There's no excitement that can make him interact with ambassadors. If you want to even help him, you may think helping him is to invite him for a meeting. Take him there. Tell him to talk. Give him your slot. When he's done talking, they will now note him that this person shouldn't come again. <laughs> because, you see, you don't use textbooks there. You use instantaneous inspirations. And if you are not operating at a height where you can bring inspiration that can confound kings, when you go there, you'll be dwarfed. Because when you now stand, what should have become the platform to announce you will become the platform that will disgrace you. That's what, what am I trying to say? Instead of looking for positions, grow your capacity. Grow your capacity. Grow your capacity. Grow your capacity. And when your capacity grows, any door that opens, you come as a celebrated monarch. So when you become a legislator, God now begins to give you rank. And the first rank is the rank of an intercessor. See five things that happen to you before you become an intercessor. I'm now running against time. So let me list fast so that we can make progress. The last point is what I want to dwell on so that I can charge my spirit a little. You know, when I don't have time, I try to calm the place down. An intercessor must pass four, five tests. Number one is the test of purity. If your garment is stained, you will be a casualty of war. Because when you go to the marketplace of nations, there are spirits there that injure men. So if you think the first opportunity you have to a bribe is to take it, what you have done is that you have made yourself a casualty. They will not say anything. It's the day of your manifestation that they will go and bring that file and say, you took bribe. And because you took bribe, you can't qualify. And something will happen to you that will close that door forever. I'm showing you the difference between light and darkness. We operate by a different set of rules. You can have an opportunity. A pastor had an opportunity, went somewhere to preach. And they told him, whatever you, you need, have it. Even the sisters that came to serve were part of the amenities. <laughs> so if you need steak, other steak, if you need a buffet, there's buffet. And there are other kinds of buffet. And the pastor, are you serious? He saw it as an opportunity. That's how ministry ended. Because you cannot touch certain things. He said, come out from among them. He said, touch not the unclean things. They that bear the vessels of God must be holy. 
One of the signatures we must possess is that we don't compromise. We stand rigidly under the government of a kingdom that is eternal. The Bible said, the standard of the Lord standeth sure. He said, therefore the Lord knoweth them that are his. And he said, they that name it the name of the Lord. He said, they must depart from iniquity. If your garment is stained, you have lost your priesthood. Because Satan can resist you. He said, Zacharias the high priest stood in his office as a high priest. He said, but Satan was resisting him. And there was nothing God could do except, as he said, take off the filthy garment. If the filthy garment is on you, you have no priesthood for the nations. I'm telling you because they've taught us how to cut corners. And they make us feel it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In Jesus, we have forgiveness. So you have forgiveness of sin. And then you see people who are living the practice of fornication, hoping they will wield scepter where kings are talking. That's why you see young people die of high blood pressure. You see young people die of cancer. And you are wondering, these are supposed to be things that attack old men. They've touched the forbidden fruit. And because they are living dark lives in secret, they become vulnerable. God will forgive you, but you will not have power for kingdom. Because the heir, so long as he's a child, is not different from a servant. You are the heir. You have all that Christ has given you. But if you choose the path of field in the spirit, they look at you like a servant. And he said, you will be placed under tutors and governors. If God wants to help you, he will bring you under tutors and governors. A generation of people who cut corners, liars, criminals, manipulators, calling the name of Jesus and thinking they will receive prophecy to prosper and live in darkness. That's not the priesthood of Melchizedek. When it has to do with Christ, your garment must be pure. If your garment is not pure, you have no place for Jesus. If God wants to help you, he will take you from that throne so that you don't bring ridicule to the name of God. The first test of an intercessor, one who stands in the gap, is that his garment must be pure. The second thing God will test you on is brokenness. Only men of a contrite heart and a broken spirit can wield the gifts of the ages to come. Because when you become proud, it's God himself that will resist you. He said, God resisted the proud, but he giveth more grace to the humble. The grace you need to talk so that kings will marvel at you, it comes when you pass the test of brokenness. If you think it's to go there to show that you are the most intelligent person on the table, you are a joker. If you go there, you must show them that you are under another king. You are but the servant of the Most High. Because when they ask you, how do you know these things? You will not say it because I have three degrees from Harvard. You say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But you see, when proud people go to the table, they want to receive the glory for themselves. Go and check everyone who took nations in the Bible. Every time they are asked an opportunity, they are asked a question, they channel the glory to God. How do you think Pharaoh knew that Joseph was a prophet? Because Joseph himself made him know that I'm a servant of God. And so Pharaoh said, because God has shown you these things. He didn't say, you know these things because you are intelligent. He said, God showed you these things. Therefore, there's no one in your class. Take over. We want to go to the table of nations. And our pride is too bogus. God has no place to feature in. Our priesthood will be questioned. If you want to be a man who stands in the gap for others, you must pass the test of brokenness. God will make sure that humility becomes one of the heaviest molecules of your life. The third test you pass as an intercessor is the test of burdens. Burdens. An intercessor, like I told you, is not just a prayer warrior. When you find an intercessor praying, he's praying what is in the heart of the Father. And so, although it's important for you to prosper in the stock market, but what, what, what is God's program there? If you don't know God's program there, and you think you just want to go there and excel, that place is too big for your appetite. Because the Bible said, if you have what to eat, what to wear, and where to lay your head, it said be content with it. When you are talking about billions, do you think the men who own billions is for food, it's for car. It's for what, for, for what to wear. No, they are certain monies that is too big for your need. Those monies are for the needs of a generation. Yes. And so if you want to take over in the market as an intercessor who is representing God in the priesthood, you must know the burdens of God. When God begins to turn your attention to government and governance, 
ask him what do you want from this corridor if god begins to turn your attention to to the real estate ask him what do you want from here if god is turning your attention to the diamond market ask him what is your program i'm not going there just because i need a better life i'm going there because you have an agenda and so that agenda is what drives you when the agenda of god begins to drive you and the burdens of god becomes your body then you have passed the test of an intercessor and it's on the strength of that that god will begin to give you the authority to declare a thing and it shall be established but you see most of us don't understand how the priesthood work we don't know the dynamics and because we don't know the dynamics we cannot wield the authorities you see many people telling you they want to be as wealthy as elon musk they want to take the cyberspace they want to take the stock market what do you do with 10 billion dollars you think all of that is for a car you think all of that is for you to travel to bahamas god has an agenda and so when god is talking empowerment over systems and nations it's because there's an agenda he wants to drive that's why i said remember the lord your god it is he that giveth the power to get wealth that you may establish his covenants even unto this day when the burdens of god becomes your burdens you will notice that there will be strange speed there will be strange acceleration and there will be strange empowerment in all your operations you won't even be able to explain it the reason is because in the place of body we synchronize with god we and god become one that's what happened to moses he said when moses was come of age he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He started feeling the burdens of God because the people of God were in captivity. The people of God were in torment and in torture. That was what affected Moses. Moses was not looking for to become a great prophet. He was not desiring to become somebody that had rule over Egypt. He just had the burden to liberate Israel. And as that burden was growing, God now empowered that burden. And on the strength of that, he commissioned Moses to take over the agenda of delivering Israel from the captivity of Egypt. The third qualification of an intercessor is the ability to sustain body. The fifth qualification is stamina. 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 Stamina in the spirit is the capacity to focus on God and God only. Wow. There is a realm you get to in power. You will be shocked the number of distractions there are. You are just going to work every day coming back as a banker. You don't know what is happening. You have a salary of 100,000 kwacha, 150,000 kwacha, and that's okay. You are just living your life. Wait until you become the CEO of a bank. They will tell you we have dinner in Saudi Arabia. And that dinner, the room where they will serve that dinner, if you see those who are serving, you will now know that, oh, there are bankers and there are bankers. those who have, who, have to, who have gone to certain places. You will see some distraction that even when you come back, after three months, the distraction will be in the center of your brain. Every day to be real to you because of how vivid and how pleasurable that distraction is. You will carry it in your mind. If you don't have the priesthood that stands in the presence to knock it off, next weekend you will go back even when there's no dinner. That's why you see that most of our leaders are not in our country. Somebody say he's a senator representing a district. He doesn't visit. He visits there only during election. Senator relocates from the district that he's representing. He goes to live in another nation. Every week, senator is in Dubai. He leaves Dubai. He's in Kuwait. He leaves Kuwait. He's in Paris. He's pursuing distraction because there's no priesthood. Now, those distractions are the things that make men siphon the commonwealth of the people and waste them. Because if you don't have stamina, if you see, you will go to certain meetings and you will see some, for those of you who are men, you will see some women, they will walk in. The perfume they will put on. If you perceive that perfume, you will remember it for two years. <laughs> perfume. And then when you come, they will say, this person will assist you for this week. When she turns and says, hi. When you leave that conference, you will be hearing high, high, high. For two months, you hear high. High, high, high.
high won't go. High will become a, a reverberation. Before you know what is happened, you don't you have not seen anything. You will see some men when they come to a meeting with you, they just talk to you, they give you a gift. When you open it, what you will see there will be more than what you have earned in 10 years. And then they tell you, please call me. That please call me. Even if you are a married woman, you will hear it a million times. You will tell your husband next week that there is a course. You are going for training for two weeks. Because that please call me. What he gave you will enter your soul and eat you. I'm telling you why many don't survive in the marketplace. It's a treacherous ground. You will need stamina to survive there. Otherwise, you will go there and you will lose your work with God. Why do you think many of our leaders can't stay in our country? They have met some Arabian girls. They have met some Brazilian ladies. And every weekend, the moment is Friday, their head turns backward. They want to go for that party till Saturday night. It's on Monday they come back to office and they say, where are the files? They are signing what they can't read. Because they don't have stamina in priesthood. You, do you know how? You think life is as simple as this one. You are saying, oh Lord, give me house rent. The problems are not down. They are up. One of my mentors told a story. He said he went for a meeting somewhere and the lady they attached him to, she just, whether she was drinking water or something, water dropped on her and the water rolled from her arm straight down. One, one molecule didn't hang. The way the skin was. He saw that vision for two weeks. <laughs> if he goes home, he wants to pray, he will just see the skin, the way the, the way the skin. He had to pray, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. <laughs> Did you read about Solomon? Wise man, great entrepreneur, but suddenly he met strange women. He started building different altars and introduced foreign gods to corrupt the covenant of God because there was no stamina. There was no stamina. Before God calls you his certified intercessor, he will check the stamina of your spirit. What can you ignore to focus on God? Can you ignore power? Can you ignore money? Can you ignore women? Can you ignore influence? If you don't have the capacity to ignore everything and stay true to the visions of Abba, you are not a man to be sent to the marketplace. Because commissioning is a rank in the spirit. And for those of us who are priests, God will carry us through this route. When you enter here and God certifies you and you begin to talk and the installations of darkness begins to fall, you will now notice that there are two other things that happens to an intercessor. Number one is warfare. Because when you start praying and things the devil has planted in territories begin to fall, they will see you as a threat. Who is that person that spoke and this, this program that has lasted for 50 years was shut down? They will come for you. And when they come for you, then God will give you the fifth qualification, which is discernment. So that you will know when to run. You will know when to stand to fight. You will know when to sit. You will know when to hide. An intercessor is like the wind. There are times when he rises up with bows and arrows and he fights. There are other times when he disappears. And so for two weeks, nobody sees you. And they say, where has he gone to? You are hiding because discernment has come. Not every battle is fought. Some are avoided. But if you don't have the weapon of discernment, you will not know what it takes to operate in those corridors. Ask those that God has commissioned. Their greatest strength. What makes them invincible is the weapon of discernment. He says, as the wind bloweth, thou knowest not from whence it cometh or whence it goeth. He says, so are they that are born by the Spirit of God. You can go for some meetings. They ask you a question and you don't answer. You just, you just do like this. Whether you, you are saying yes or no, they can't tell. <laughs> Because that, that meeting is not your answer they are looking for. They just wanted to say you too spoke there so that they will include you among people that will become victims. And so the Holy Ghost tells you, your voice cannot be heard. And so, although you couldn't escape the meeting, you came. When they are talking, you are just doing like this. You do like this until you go. They now want to probe and attack everybody that went for that meeting. They are doing voicing. When they check the whole voicing, your voice didn't appear. 
So God used discernment to teach you how to escape. And so you will see that you will be on that corridor changing things, yet you are invincible. Because now you have received the qualification to represent God in those corridors. You can't have such intelligence by studying in Harvard. You have such intelligence because you have disclosures from the realm of God. Sometimes you prepare for a meeting. As you are opening the door to enter that meeting, the Holy Ghost said, only answer the question of the man in blue. And then you enter. Only one person is wearing blue. You, become, you sit down. Others are talking. You feel like talking. Keep quiet. You respond to that one man. That's all. You go. They will now come back later and say, who is that person that spoke to the man in blue? You are the only person. And that becomes the reason why you are exonerated or elevated. All of those dynamics are weaved into priesthood. But you see, those men and intercessors, they create the opportunity to ask some of these men questions. Ask them. They will tell you. Microsecond decisions that they made because of impulses, signals that they picked in the middle of a conversation. And that became the deciding factor. And those ones can be taught. No matter how many business mentorship you attend, they don't teach those ones. Those ones are imparted. If you ascend, those things open and you are able to receive them. And those are the things that will make the difference most of the time. Somebody said the difference between life and death is a whisper. When you become an intercessor, there are other levels of authority. And the next level of rank God will give you is the rank of a guardian. You know who a guardian is? A guardian is one who has the capacity to protect others. Because the day we come in the marketplace, God will have to raise you so that you become a covering for the younger ones who are coming. Because these things, you don't master them overnight. And so you find people who should make mistakes and be cut off. But because you are there, you will say something and you will exonerate them. They couldn't access God's frequency but you became God's presence for them in that corridor. And if the church will grow, we will need people who are mature enough to provide covering for others. Because one, you will open the door for them, and then while they are on the table, you will provide support structure so that they are not put to shame. And when they miss it, you will become a system of intervention for them. That's how God runs it. And this is why in this kingdom, interconnection is too important so most of you who are going up there you will notice that there are many guardians in that corridor that you will meet and that's why god will first of all teach you humility because sometimes what will bring you under their covering is how you greeted them when you enter you won't come and say all of us are entrepreneurs no there are some people who are grandmasters and god raised them there to cover others and when you read the scripture you'll find it in acts chapter 9 Jesus appeared to Paul and told him, go to the city, you'll be told what to do. How can you meet Jesus and Jesus directs you to a man? Because there is a structure he has put in place that he will not violate. I know there are people who use, it, who use this um, covering system to make witchcraft and oppress people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about a place of purity where people who sincerely love you and look out for your good and have the authority to help you rise exist. That's what Abraham did for Lot. Two occasions, Lot was in danger. Abraham operated as a guardian. One with the kings and another with God himself. And it was because of Abraham that Lot was saved. That's a guardian. In Acts chapter 10 verse 29, no, 20 verse 29, Paul said to the church in Ephesus, he said, when I leave you, he said, wolves will come. The Holy Ghost is still there, but the guardian has gone. Wow. And so what God does is that when you grow as an intercessor, he will now increase your rank again and make you a guardian so that you will become a covering to others who are coming into that corridor. That's why most of us here, you see that God keeps connecting us to people. We are helping them. We are giving counsel. We are defending them. We are intervening. It's a place. It's a rank. That rank will cause those responsibilities to come to you. And when those things begin to happen and you see that your life is becoming an intervention for others, know that you have grown to become a guardian. And because of you, the heritage of God in systems and territories can be preserved. It is not given to you so that you can oppress others. It is given to you so that through you, people can see the faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, and the intervention of God. But you must grow to become a guardian. And if we will take over 
territories and systems, we need many guardians. Because that's one of the things the people of the world understand. They know who to call and change the table. But when you come to the church, if you have a problem in the market, you turn, you are stranded. Even the people who can help you, you call them, they won't pick. Because they think it's about me and my family. They don't know it's a system of the kingdom. But when we understand that this thing is God creating a program to take over territories and systems, we will know when we have grown from intercessors to become guardians. And when we become guardians, we look out for the weak to deliver them so that our ranks can become large. Otherwise, if we are few, we will be depleted, we will be defeated, and we will not be able to take over. A conference like this, for instance, is an opportunity for guardians to impart you. And some, at some point, there may be interactions where guardians will give you some connections to open some doors for you. And in those interactions, some challenges you had that nobody could help you. As you are talking, some guardians can still help you. This is where systemic takeover comes in. That men grow to have the capacity to provide covering for others. their ranks. When you grow to a guardian, then you grow to become a watcher. These are levels. A watcher is one who has the authority first to, pre to protect the territory from what is coming in. And he also has the authority to judge what is going wrong. It is an authority level in priesthood. It's a rank. And so you notice in scripture, in fact, it's at this level that men become equal with angels. Study the Bible, Daniel 4, 7, 13. When the king fell, it was the watcher that judged him. He said, this is the decree of the watchers. They had power to judge. And when you study the Bible, you see some men who operated like that. In Acts 13, when Paul was preaching to the proconsul in the marketplace, and the sorcerer came to darken his heart, Paul judged him. He said, the hand of God is upon you. You will be blind for a season. You son of the devil, you are inter stopping the move of God. He judged him immediately because he had grown to a level where he can say things, do things that forestall issues that would have negated the agenda of God. And many will rise like that. And so in the body of Christ, we need to also mature to a level where people who have capacity to intercept demonic programs and also to judge wickedness so that the agenda of God prosper must rise. So we grow from intercessors to becoming guardians. We grow from guardians to becoming watchers. And so a man can tell, call the president of Zambia and tell him, listen, they are coming with a proposal in the next two weeks. Don't take that proposal. They want to enslave Zambians. And he has the authority for the president to listen. Because over the years, his antecedents will speak. He said, if you take that business, after six years, Zambians will be in trouble. And because he spoke, the president won't do it. If such a person is not available, there will be over one million young entrepreneurs who will become victims of that program because they are intercessors, but they didn't have a watcher. And so the watcher intercepts the program of darkness and creates a system of safety for the people of God. It is also part of priesthood. That was where Peter grew to. When Philip went to the church in Samaria, after he won people to Christ, miracles happened. He had to send for the apostles to come. And when Peter came, Peter saw a sorcerer who wanted to use the power of God for evil. And he judged him. He said, I perceive that you have the gall of bitterness. He said, thy money perish with you. Because the guy would have brought error to the foundation of the church in, in that city. The evangelist, the young evangelist couldn't see it. But the watcher saw through the guy's motive. If it was Philip, you would have felt, wow, this power I have is so much. People are begging for it now. Take. But a watcher saw that this guy wants to pervert God's program. He said, your money perish with you. He judged. When Ananias sold land and brought part of the proceeds and lied to Peter, he said, why have you allowed Satan to enter your heart? He wanted to bring corruption to the foundation of the church. But Peter was a watcher. So he had matured. He has ma See, I'm showing you this so that you will know. When you leave this conference, there will be many levels of maturity that you will enter. Amen. Some of you will leave this conference, you will receive open doors, but it's deeper than open doors. God will raise you to a level where you will become a gatekeeper in Zambia. 
God will lead you to a level where you will become a gatekeeper in Southern Africa. That's what God is doing. Look at what those who are of the priesthood of darkness are doing. From the ranks of Bill Gates, they will come enter into economic negotiations and programs that will reduce the population of Africa. Because as far as they are concerned, in the production cadre, Africans are consumers. And so in order to stabilize nations, that's the agenda of the globalists. In order to stabilize nations, they will have to reduce population. And the best place to reduce population is in Africa. How many Africans have the stature to come to those tables and say, no, Africans matter. We are the future of the earth. There are no watchers. There are no men of that authority. And so when we are talking about marketplace, we must see beyond my business is prospering. We need men who have the capacity to negotiate God's agenda for territories, for generations, and for continents. Otherwise, they will do an antibiotics that will sterilize men for the next 10 years. And because you are not on that table, you won't know. And so you will discover that men take drugs and suddenly they become impotent because they want to control population. Who will tell you? All you know is that there's a new antibiotic and you are drinking. But there was nobody on that table to say, no, I refuse. Africa will not be a victim because we don't have people who have the stature to be watchers. So a conference like this is talking about matters that are higher than just I am prospering. What did they say during COVID? They say, men, we lie on the street dead in Africa. You think they didn't have a plan? If not for the mercy of God, even the, the nose mask you are wearing, some of them would have been infected. So you are wearing nose masks, think you are avoiding COVID, but you are inhaling disease. And so we need people who are watchers. They can intercept programs, global programs, and say this one can happen. We need men who are watchers, who can intercept international programs and say this one cannot happen. That's the level of authority God is looking at. What God is looking at is not my business is prospering. Some of you will be young. In your 30s, you will sit on those tables. You, do, you think, do you know where men like Mark Zuckerberg sit down to negotiate? Over nations and continents. Why will God not raise such from Africa? Who can sit with them on such tables and make decisions? Because most of the global trends you see, it's on those tables they make them. Because at this level, it's beyond my business is prospering. At this level, we are discussing the fate of humanity. So you see them come, they tell you they are donating for polio, they are donate. you think it's donation. They are telling you that we have the right over the gate of health. We have the right over the health of people. We have the right over the population of nations. That's what they are saying. And you can't argue with them because only them have the economic power to, to, to sponsor it. You don't have it. If you talk, nobody hears you. But what happens when you begin to operate at that level? You can say, no, this program for Africa, I refuse. Because you are of the priesthood of light. That's why God raises waters. I don't have time to proceed. <laughs> if I continue from here, I will say too many sensitive things. And some things are not for the microphone. But God will give us understanding. But I want you to pray with understanding. Because some of you probably came for the conference hoping you receive an impartation to start prophesying. Hoping you receive an impartation, you know, to start healing the sick. Hoping you receive an impartation to have breakthrough in your kiosk. You say, ah, this man coming. I want somebody to lay hands on me so that I'll get a job. No, what we are talking about is beyond that. God wants to raise princes. God wants to raise kings that have influence to affect decisions that, that impact on nations. That's what God wants to do. You know, we, we are so backward as touching divine agenda today that when God is giving people influence, we say they are being ambitious. We say they, they are being carnal. We don't know where the world is going. That's why we don't talk where decisions matter. We just come to church and shout. When decisions are completed, that's when we are shouting. Shouting, shouting, and it amounts to little or nothing. As young as we are, we think we have arrived. Meanwhile, in darkness, our contemporaries, if you go to Nigeria, some of the young musicians that we are older than, 
they will have concert in Holland, pack out 50,000 stadium. Concert in London, pack out 80,000 stadium. Concert in the, the one tour, they will go to five European nations. Shut down stadium. People pay money to attend. That's the level of influence they have. And mayors of cities invite them to come into their cities. And they allow them to participate in things that bishops can participate in. Because we don't know priesthood that affect nations and territories. There is a place you can't talk until you have an influence. Influence that affects a nation. And so when God is raising you as a watcher, one of the things he will do for you is to give you so much influence. So that if you stand in a place, even the government will quiver. And if they oppose you, you may not have executive power, but you have influence. And that influence you have can cause the nation to navigate in the direction of what you say, much more than what the government says. Those are the things that make us watchers. But how many people are like that in the church? We think church is about Sunday rituals. We think church is about sacraments and it ends there. All of those things are designed to equip us so that we can go and conquer the nations. But you must have certain levels of authority. Somebody has to rise from among you here that will have so much money that the government will have to borrow from. So that when you talk on economic matters, even if they don't like what you say, they will have to follow it. That's why this conference was put together. Somebody has to rise here that has so much influence with people that if you say, I'm going to the stadium tomorrow, it's packed before the service, 10 hours before the service. And everywhere you go, they say, what's happening? They say, you have come. And because of that, the government will want to liaise with you on so many issues because they need the will of the people. And the will of the people rests with you. Those are the kinds of things God wants to begin to do. And if the church of the last day will be relevant in God's agenda, we must have these ranks. Regardless of gender, regardless of age. This thing is beyond, I laid hands on somebody in the program, he fell. I'm praying people fall down. I'm shouting people are healed. All of that is important, but if it ends there, we have nothing to give to our generation. Can we pray? I want you to ask God for one thing. Give me the grace to walk with you. Give me the grace to walk with you. There are realms that none have accessed. They are virgin dimensions in God. There are possibilities that he wants to hand over, but not too many can receive it because we can't walk with him. Tonight is the first night. That's why I'm talking like this. I'm just trying to build a coordinate that every other message can fit into. That's why I spoke in this manner. Can you ask God, give me the grace to walk with you. If you desire it, you will pray. And then I will make a declaration and sit down.
I heard, you know, I heard the other day, Elon Musk, in the middle of this crisis, at Elon Musk had a meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister. And when the IDF spokesman was giving a report, one of the major things they were reporting was the fact that they had a meeting with Elon Musk and they were discussing some things. One man is so relevant that he can determine the direction of nations. Imagine if the church had one person like that. Where you can meet any president of any nation and you can insist on policies, insist on programs that preserves the sanity of the soul and the integrity of, of humanity. Imagine. Sometimes our visions are too small and myopic. So the whole idea of the miracle service is a breakthrough. The whole idea of the miracle service is a healing. Meanwhile, these guys are growing to a level where they are trying to insist that healing is not necessary. We know what to do that you will not be sick. They are getting to a level where they want to create systems where you don't need to hear a word like breakthrough. And we are still at that primordial level. Because we can't see the future. We can't see what is coming. That's why our messages are only sensitive to territories where people have lack. We can't talk to people who have grown beyond the basic needs of life. Because we have nothing to offer them. And that's why you can't raise leaders in church. We can't think global issues. We can't think global impact. So we, our, our messages, our anointings are only relevant to the poor and helpless. Can you pray now? If God wants to make two, pray that prayer. 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 Thank God for what he has done thus far. But we trust him for greater things. Ah, hey, 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 ha. Ah, ha, ha. your hands toward heaven when I was coming here tonight I prayed and asked God talking to him from the depths of my heart to do three things number one to anoint men for leadership leadership in different spheres of human engagement we need leaders with competence at different spheres and different levels in those spheres. Number two, I ask God for the impartation of the spirit of excellence. Some of us have great ideas, but what we do has nothing attractive about it. And finally, I asked God for the grace for speed. Some of us are doing the right things, but it will take forever before what we are doing affect a small territory, let alone a nation. I asked God for the grace for speed. Lift your hands.
and receive that which is yours. Please don't distract yourself now. Father, you said you will impart us with these virtues, these graces, and these dimensions. And so, Lord, give us a sign. Anoint leaders now. Father, anoint leaders. Everyone here with the ordination of leadership. Everyone here with the grace to rule amongst men. Everyone here with the scepter. The scepter to lead a generation, a territory and a system. Wherever you are standing, right now I ask for that anointing to rest upon you. Father, from the left to the right, from the front to the back, to those watching online, lead us. Take that grace. Hush, accept them. I don't want to jack up the atmosphere again, but something is coming upon you. Lead us. Different corridors of power. Different realms of power. Different dimensions of leadership. Wherever you are standing, that grace that raises men, that grace that ordains men for leadership, global leadership in different spheres, take that unction now. Usher, accept them for me. Bring them, let me lay hands on them. And Lord, the spirit of excellence. We do so much in Africa. We do so much in the body. But most of the things we do does not carry the signature of excellence. Enough for the nations to desire it. Lord, even as you gave to Daniel, that dimension of excellence that attracted the attention of kings and nations. Everyone standing here, I ask for that baptism of excellence, exceptional excellence, from the left to the right, from the front to the back. Take that grace now. The grace for excellence. The spirit of excellence. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Finally, just lower the keyboard. You know, usually the first night of a conference, we just try to, to give perspective to something like a map so that the messages, the emphasis can find corporate expression. And that's why I took my time. My goal tonight is not intensity. But lastly, the hand of God will come upon some of you now for speed. I know it by experience. I know it. The reason it looked like some of us just appeared from nowhere is a grace for speed. Where you will show up and you will make it right to the top. Father, I ask for that impartation now. The grace for speed. You said the hand of God came upon Elijah and he outran the chariot of Ahab. Where you will come upon people they will, uh, they will outrun those who are established. Even the kings and the monarchs. Everyone standing here. The power, the grace, the unction for speed. In the name of Jesus. There are seven of them now. Take that unction now. Take that unction now. Take that unction now. Carry that grace. Speed by the spirit. Help them. Help them. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. I, therefore, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. If you just said this prayers, congratulations. You are now a member of the family of God. Kindly send us an email, prayer at encounterjesusministriesinternational.org. You can also visit our website at www. 